we thank Ari for that wonderful reminder of the ridiculous nature of grace that God would completely know us and love us anyway. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> to be fully known and fully loved by God. Praise God. What a wonderful, wonderful message. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth. After Judges. Let's go to the front of your Bible, start turning. <laughs> You'll eventually find it tucked away there between Judges and 1 Samuel. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read the first chapter, Ruth chapter 1. Verses 1 through 22. <clears throat> the Bible says, Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judea went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judea. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. And the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she rose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the land of Moab, for, the, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you, be, that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. <clears throat> then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, no, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, return my daughters, why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse 
if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came about when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and with her, Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word this morning. As we come to Holy Scripture, we ask that you would teach your people. I pray, Lord God, that we would see ourselves in the pages of Holy Scripture, that we would turn from our wicked ways and help us, Lord God, to be the people that you've called us to be in Christ, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Years ago, beginning in 2001 through 2011, I took you through a series of portraits on biblical mothers in the Bible. This series of portraits stretched from Jacobin, the mother of Moses, to the widow of Nain, who, encountered, who was encountered by Jesus while proceeding to bury her son. I entitled this series, Lessons from the Lives of Exemplary Mothers. What follows is what we learn from each of these women and their stories in the Bible. Jochebed, we saw a mother of courage. In Hannah, we saw a mother's strength and faithful resolve. In the widow of Zarephath, we saw a, a mother's hope. The mother of King Lamuel taught us about a mother's wisdom. The prophet's widow gave us insight into a mother's protection. The Shunammite woman granted us a comprehension of the gift of motherhood. The Seraphonician woman, a mother's humbleness. And then the widow of Nain, a mother's helplessness. Well, this morning I want to return again to the idea of portraits. But this time, I, wanna, I would like to cover some of the other mothers we missed out in our first look at portraits of godly mothers. However, not only would I like to delve into some new mothers, uh, I want to focus this time our attention on the issue of faith. Faith. What we learn about faith from these biblical mothers. Not only to encourage our mothers here at Berean to be to better understand faith and to be women of faith, but to show all of us, men, women, and children, how we can be people of faith as well. Well, if we're going to be talking about faith over the next few years, uh, we need to define faith first. So let's look at what faith is. What does the Bible say about faith? How does the Bible define it? Well, that faith is an important part of the Bible's perspective on the believer's life is made clear early on in the biblical story. Interestingly, it's not the usage of the Hebrew word for faith that identifies for us its first appearance in the Bible, but rather it's one of the most exhaustive discussions of faith in the Bible that tell us where faith begins, and that's in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. In that text, the author of Hebrews identifies faith first in a man named Abel. Of course, Abel was the, was the son of Adam and Eve. And listen to what Hebrews says about Abel in Hebrews 11 verse 4. It says, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God Testing, testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. 
That is, according to Hebrews 11, the earliest witness to the reality of faith in human history. Within this statement, we find out that faith moves a person to correctly interact with God and gives witness to the reality of righteousness in the person who possesses it. If you possess faith, if you have faith, biblical faith, the Bible identifies you as righteous. But what exactly is faith? Well, the opening of Hebrews 11 says this in Hebrews 11 verse 1. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, the key words here are assurance and hope, conviction and unseen. This statement is reflective of Hebrew poetry with, with parallel ideas being used to communicate one thought. In other words, assurance in this verse aligns with conviction and hope aligns with unseen. In other words, what the, what the author of Hebrews is saying is this, that faith is, a, is confidence in something that's not visible to the naked eye at the time that faith is exercised. So you exercise faith, although you do not see the outcome of your faith. You believe anyway. You have conviction. You have confidence. That's the concept of faith. Now, Let's apply this understanding of faith to the first appearance of the word faith in the Bible. And that's Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. A famous verse. Uh, this is the verse, of course, that we know that our salvation is based on. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, listen to what Moses wrote. This is regarding Abraham. It says, then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and, and he, God, listen, reckoned it to him as righteousness. This verse, based on the inferential or temporal conjunction then that, that begins it, attached what was going on here with what preceded it. You see, in the preceding four verses of Genesis chapter 15, God had rejected Abraham's wish to have his servant serve as his heir. Remember what's going on. God had years before promised Abraham he would have a child. Well, Abraham gets to chapter 15 and says, hey, where's the child? I thought you promised me a child. And then Abraham says, I have a servant who was born in my house. Let him be my heir. So he asks God to accept his servant in the place of an heir so that the promise God gave would come to him. God says, I'm not accepting your servant. God then in verses 4 and 5 takes Abraham out of his tent and he says, look up into the heavens, Abraham. And, and he says, Abraham, just as you can't count the stars, that's what your people are going to be like to come from you physically. Then in verse 5 it says, he believed God. He believed God, and God counted that as righteousness. That's, of course, the basis of how we're saved. We're saved by faith, not by works, just as Abraham was. God looked at his faith, and he reckoned it. He attributed righteousness to him because of faith. Now, let me ask you a question. Is this where Abraham's faith began? Think about that. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Although Abraham exercised faith here, what does the exercise of faith entail? It entails everything that we are. Our mind, our emotions, and our will all go into our faith. Let me, let me describe for you the, the scope of, of faith. When you trust in God, that means that you must understand who God is and what he has promised and then trust in him. In other words, ignorance and faith don't go hand in hand. 
You have to be informed to exercise faith. Isn't that the case with Abraham? God promised Abraham something. He told Abraham, I'm going to do this for you. And Abraham responded. So the mind is involved in the exercise of faith. You must be intellectually informed of something to believe it. But, but, the, but the emotions are also involved in faith. In other words, it's essential to trust in God that you relent from your own position and perspective and accept what God has stated or demanded. This is what happened in Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, Abraham said, God, accept my servant as a way to fulfill your promise. God says, I'm not accepting your servant. What if, what if Abraham had said, well, if you don't accept my servant, I don't want anything from you. Abraham had to relent from his viewpoint in order to embrace God's viewpoint. That's an emotional response. Abraham had to detach himself from his own views and he, and he had, to, had to assent, agree with God's view. And then our will must be involved. Our mind must be involved. Our emotions must be involved. But our will must be involved as well. Abraham had to embrace God's decision. He had to be informed about it. He had to relent from his own viewpoints. And then he had to embrace God's perspective. And that's the only way to be saved, church. That's the only way to be saved. You have to hear the gospel. You have to hear that you're a sinner and that you must repent and turn to Christ. And then you must relent from trying to save yourself. You must stop trying to save yourself. You must believe what the Bible says about you is true. And then you must embrace God's solution, who is Jesus. That's what faith is. It's, it's the mind informed. It's the, it's the will assenting and relenting of its own viewpoints and it's uh, the, sorry the, the the emotions relenting and assenting to its own viewpoint and then the will embracing what God gives but I asked you a question earlier is this where Abraham's faith began well if we look at the Bible the the promise to Abraham was first given in Gen Genesis chapter 12, and it was repeated again in Genesis chapter 13. In other words, Abraham was exercising faith even before Genesis 15. But was he exercising faith perfectly? In Hebrews 11 verse 8, it makes this statement about Abraham. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. So, so even back in chapter 12, he was already exercising faith. But listen to what happened in Genesis chapter 17. God came to Abraham, and in chapter 17 told him that, that his wife, Sarah, was going to be the one who gave birth to his child. Now, now, Abraham thought this was strange. Not only was Abraham past bearing children, Sarah was past having children. And Sarah, remember, had just given Abraham Hagar, and he had had a child through Hagar. And so Abraham, in Genesis 17, asks God to accept Ishmael in the place of the promise. God says, I'm not accepting Ishmael. Sarah herself is going to have a child. Look at Abraham's response in Genesis chapter 17, beginning in the 17th verse. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said, this in, heart, said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Ain't going to happen. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before, before thee. But God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. 
Does that sound like faith to you? Sounds like a man struggling with his faith. When God gives faith, does that mean you no longer have any struggles? You no longer have any doubts? You, know, you just skate through life because you have faith. And everything works out the way you ha you, that you expected. And, and you understand everything perfectly. You no longer have any questions. Is that what faith means? I don't know about you, but it seems to me that Abraham had a few struggles. You see, although we get no more faith than what, we, than what God gives us at the beginning of our life as a Christian, faith can mature and grow. And it needs to grow in us. This morning, I want to look at the journey of a certain mother in Scripture, Naomi, and what we learn about faith from her life, and then apply what we learn to us. So now that we've defined faith, let's look at an example of faith in the book of Ruth. The first thing we see here in the book of Ruth, in Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, is faith tested. Faith tested. The story of Ruth, the story of Naomi here, found in the book of Ruth, does not start out very well. Although Naomi's name means delightful or pleasant, we would see her delight evaporate quickly here in the first part of this book. She was Judean by birth, and Naomi had been married to a man named Elimelech. This man, upon the occurrence of a severe famine in Israel, abandoned the promised land in hopes of finding security and profit in Moab outside of God's protective care. Let me say it again. There was difficulty in the promised land where God's protection was. So his idea was, let's leave God's protective care and go to Moab and see if we can succeed over there. That's a sermon all by itself. What they found outside of God's will was death. In fact, we learn quickly that Elimelech passed away, leaving his wife and his two sons, Malon and Chilion. And then we also learn that the two boys, Malon and Chilion, died shortly after their father died, although they had been in the, in the land of Moab for just over 10 years, according to verses 3 through 5. This sad situation left Naomi by herself with her two daughters-in-law who had married her boys, Orpah and Ruth, and they were all, well, she was in a foreign land. Can you imagine how she must have, have felt? Now, the author does not clue us in yet to her feelings, but instead he informs us about the news of the subsiding of the famine, so she decides in verse 6 to go home. Uh, this would serve as a motivation for her to wrap up her, her fears in, in Moab and to return to the promised land. Now, now, this journey was going to be arduous. It was going to be dangerous. But the risks were well worth taking because she couldn't survive as a widow in a foreign land. Back home in Israel, she had the family land she could go back to. And so she decided to return. Look at verse 6. It says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law and, and that she might return from the land of Moab. Why? For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So it seems as we look at this story that her and her two daughters-in-law begin the journey back to Israel. But in verses 7 through 13, we see that Naomi tells her daughters-in-law to stay in Moab. There's no sense going to Israel. There's nothing for them in Israel. No Israelite is going to marry a Moabitess. And she can't have any more children who would want to marry them. Because even if she were to get pregnant that night, they wouldn't wait around until those, those, those boys grew up. It's not possible. So she counsels them to leave and go back to their father's house. 
is here for the first time that we get some in hint that Naomi blamed God for her situation and not her and her husband's decision to abandon the promised land. In verse 13, notice, she claimed that God had acted against me, she said. And then she said it was hard for her. We might think that both Naomi's word of discouragement and her claim to be resisted by God would serve to motivate the girls to remain in the safety of Moab. And at first, that doesn't seem to be the case. While the older of the two cut bait and left, returning for the safety and the security of her family and her culture, the younger woman, Ruth, appears to be a little more reticent to leave. Notice verse 14 of chapter 1. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth, notice, clung to her. Clung to her. Here we see in the opening lines of the story that faith, our faith, is oftentimes tested in this life. In hardship, the decision was made here to leave the promised land, to leave the context of God's safety for the purpose of gaining safety. Don't we do that? Don't we leave the place of safety? Looking for safety? We, 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 we follow Christ and we, and we run in, in the difficulties and some of us think, well, maybe it's following Christ is the problem. No, faith, leave, faith motivates us when we exercise it properly to remain even in difficult times in the place that God has given us to stay. Naomi decided to leave. Elimelech decided to leave, and they bore the consequences of leaving. You see, experiencing God's safety requires faith. It requires maintaining the course established by God's word, even when the course seems to be difficult. Sometimes we, God's people, fail these tests of faith. When we do, the result is that our faith is shaken, as we see next in verses 15 through 22. As Naomi attempted to encourage Ruth to reconsider her disposition and go home, Ruth responded with what was one of the most powerful statements of commitment found in all the Bible. Listen again as we read verses 16 and 17 of verse 1. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus... May the Lord do to me and worse if anything but death parts you and me. Uh, although this is one of the most often quoted sections of Scripture during wedding ceremonies, <laughs> this is not about a wedding. <laughs> All right? uh, so oftentimes people take the Scripture out of context and apply it in places it's not meant to be applied. This is an expression of a personal commitment to Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, to to the God of Israel. Jesus is not in this text directly. This is a personal commitment to the God of Israel and the people of Israel that Ruth was expressing. This would be the last time that Ruth's determination would be questioned. And the two women made the arduous trek back to Israel in verses 18 and 19. Now just think, it, it had been over, it had been well over 10 years, maybe even 10, 15, maybe even 18, 20 years maybe. I, we're, not, we're not sure the exact time, but we know over, over a decade, Naomi had been away. And so she comes into town, and you can imagine the town of Bethlehem that is in, in shock. They're in amazement at her appearance. But it's in this context of her return to, the, to, to her city that Naomi's disposition becomes fully manifested. Now that she was in familiar territory, she could vent, and vent she did. 
what she had only hinted at earlier, would spill out of her. Yes, she had followed her husband out of the promised land, away from God's protective care, and had tried to escape the experience of difficulty, but it was God, as far as Naomi was concerned, who had let her down. Look at verse 20 of chapter 1. There it says, And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She told the ladies to call her Mara. Mara means bitter. Mara means bitter. Her, her name, Naomi, meant pleasant, pleasant, but she wants to now be referred to as bitter. The reasons for this are twofold. Notice in our text, first off, who can stand against the Lord? Notice how in verse 13, she called God the Lord, Yahweh. But here, in, in verse 20, she calls God Shaddai, Almighty. In other words, she's saying, who can stand against the Almighty? Who can, who can stop God from doing what he, God made me this way. He, he embittered my situation. He, he, he took my husband and my sons. I, I couldn't stand against what he wanted to do. He's the Almighty. He treated me bitterly. He treated me bitterly. And now I am bitter. The bitterness she felt, the grief, the anguish, the unpleasant nature of her present life, she laid at God's feet for what God had done to her. And she described this further in verse 21. What exactly did God do to her? Listen to what she said. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? God is the one who acted to make her life bitter and full of anguish. He was the one who took away everything that she had, taking her from being full to being empty. God had compiled a case against her. She said he witnessed against her. God was, in, God was the judge, and she was in his court, and God witnessed against her and brought evil on her, brought ruin upon her. God was afflicting her, she said. Again, no mention of her own decision. No mention of her husband's decision to leave the promised land. Doesn't mention that. She's upset at God. How could God leave me in this state? The wording here reminds us of another figure who experienced this type of emptying in their life. The, the same word translated harder and bitterly here is the same word was also used in Job chapter 27, verse 2 by Job. Job said, as God lives, who has taken away my right, and the Almighty who has embittered my soul. But Naomi was more akin to Job's wife than to Job because it was Job's wife who told Job to curse God and die. Job's wife was in despair in Job 1, verses 9 through 10. And, and Naomi was in despair. But I have a question for you. If you were in her shoes, wouldn't you be in despair? Wouldn't you be like her? Has, has your faith ever been shaken before? Mine has. I, you, you, you might be skating through life and everything is just hunky-dory, but my life has been shaken and my faith has been shaken. Have you ever been led to question God more, more than trust him? Can, can you identify this morning with where Naomi is in her place? Can, can you get off of your situation and just for a moment put yourself in her shoes? I've been right where she is. But might I point something out to you this morning, if you would let me? The beginning of her solution was returning to the promised land. Don't miss that. Things would begin to turn around because she came back. 
to the place of God's blessing. <laughs> when we're in despair, when we're in doubt, when we're questioning God, we don't want to be around God's people. We don't want to go to church. We don't want to be where God would have us to be, right? We, 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 we stop connecting with the people of God. We, we stop attending church, and it's, oh, woe is me. What we don't realize is we need to return to the place of God's blessing. That's right, brother. That's right, brother. And Naomi's situation began to turn around because she returned. She didn't stay in Moab. Right. Now, she was in Moab because of her own decisions. Sometimes... We're in a negative place because of our own choices. That's right. Sometimes, let's be honest, we made that decision. We had another option and we went with this option because that's what we wanted. And man, the trickle down really placed us in a negative circumstance. But I'm glad today that when she was in Moab, she heard a word that God had begun to move and she went back to the place of blessing. God doesn't stop talking (laughs) because you're in Moab. God doesn't stop working because you're in Moab. God doesn't stop doing what he does because you're in Moab. And if you would just listen and go back, you might find yourself in a situation that is turning around. We see that here. For as the first chapter closes out, God would already be turning around both her circumstances and her disposition without her even knowing it. Listen to verse 22 of chapter 1. It says, So Naomi returned, and with her Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Mm, Don't miss that, church. You see, there are two things here in this verse that will change ultimately the disposition of Naomi. One is Ruth, her daughter-in-law, and the second one is the barley harvest. But you say, well, the barley harvest isn't a person. It's not a person, but it's it's, 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 it's God's use of the circumstances of life to change our disposition. Ruth and the barley harvest, two things that moving through the rest of the book will change Naomi's entire disposition. We see God begin to do it as he enlivens her faith. Doesn't create a faith. She always had the faith, but God begins to enliven it in verses, chapter, 20, chapter 2, verses 1 through 22. As the spotlight of our story shifts from Naomi and Ruth to Ruth and Boaz, Naomi would not be left too far from center stage. The story of Ruth and Boaz is one of the greatest stories of courtship and love found in the Bible. Years ago in my major series on Christian marriage, I spent three of the 30 plus sermons in that series on the book of Ruth, seeking to help single Christians prepare for marriage. These can be found on our church app. However, uh, I, I want to stay on task this morning and focus on Naomi, not necessarily Ruth and Boaz. Now, now we have to do a little bit of Ruth and Boaz so we can understand Naomi, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little bit of Ruth and Boaz, but our focus is going to be primarily on Naomi. Now, the groundwork for the relationship between Ruth and Boaz is laid out in chapter 2 of Ruth. And here we see that their relationship will be established upon biblical principles and ideals. Let me just say something to the single Christians this morning. If you desire to get married, understand that the only, the only proper way to be married is to be married based on biblical principles. Don't make the decision to marry any old body. Amen. You're putting yourself in Moab. Right. Right. And you can't get out of that one. 
biblical principles, biblical ideals form the basis of proper relation. And we see that here at the beginning of chapter 2. How do we see it? Well, 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 Boaz, according to verses 10 through 12, had heard about the godly character and sacrifice of Ruth. He was impressed with her spiritually. Also, in verses 4 through 7, Boaz is introduced as a man of godly priorities. He, he expressed the Jewish faith fairly and without bias. He was a godly man. So she was a godly woman, and, and he was a godly man, and together they would ultimately make a godly couple. We see in verses 1 through 3, that God sovereignly orchestrated their meeting through the barley harvest. You see, according to verse 2, she happened upon the field of Boaz. Verse 3, sorry, she happened upon the field of Boaz. Now, understand, understanding how fields go, how, how Bethlehem would have been in, the, in, 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 in ancient Israel. Bethlehem, the, the city, would have been surrounded by acres of fields. These fields would have been marked off by boundary stones. And so each family would have had a section. It, to the naked eye, it looked like one big field all around, all around Bethlehem, one huge field to, to the naked eye. But when you began to walk in the field, you would find these boundary stones, and the boundary stones would separate one family's property from another family's property. Ruth wanders out of Bethlehem and just happens upon the field of Boaz. <laughs> it's divine sovereignty, church. It's divine sovereignty. God was in the process of changing not only Ruth's life, but Naomi's too. God was working. And she happened upon that field. And from that time on in the book of Ruth, the interaction between Ruth and Boaz will be intentional, intentional, as both of them begin the work of accomplishing what God has described should happen in these type of circumstances. What am I saying? Well, in, in the Old Testament, God said that a farmer had the responsibility of not harvesting the corners of his field. So think of, think of a field as a square, as a square plot. You could, you, could far, you could harvest everything inside of the circle, but the corners of the field you couldn't harvest. Why? Well, the corners of the field were for poor people, people who were down, down on their luck, if you want to say, say it that way, people who, who had need. And so they could go into any field and harvest the corners of the field. Well, that was, that was Ruth. Ruth didn't have anything. She was poor. And so she went out to harvest the corners of the field. And, and Boaz allowed her, because he was biblical, he was a godly man, allowed her to harvest the corners. But as you read the story, you find out that he didn't just do that. What does Boaz do? He, he calls his servants aside where Ruth can't hear him in other words, he's not doing this to impress Ruth. <laughs> Follow me here, church. He's doing it to impress God, right? He, he waits till she's over there, calls his servants and says, hey, look, take some of the wheat and just drop it. <laughs> just drop it. <laughs> and then when she goes to pick it up, don't stop her from picking it up. Yeah. He tells her that, he tells the servants that, Again, outside of Ruth's hearing, because he's not doing it for Ruth, he's doing it for God. And so we see that God cares for Ruth and God cares for Naomi. Now, it's because of that that Naomi has some questions. You see, Ruth comes home with a whole bunch of grain, way more grain than she should have had, because Naomi knows what she should have had by just gleaning. So something's going on. So she begins to ask questions. Look at verse 17. Sorry, verse 19. Her mother-in-law then said to her, where did you glean today? And where did you work? 
Watch this. May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had uh, with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I worked today is Boaz. <laughs> Although the reader had been informed of the relationship between Boaz and Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech, Ruth had not been informed. So Ruth had no idea that she was actually related to Boaz by marriage. Here for the first time she learns that this man is my relative by marriage. Look at verse 20. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of the Lord. Watch this, watch this. Who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Mm. Watch this. <laughs> you can't help but notice the difference in tone between Naomi at the end of the first chapter and Naomi at the end of the second chapter. Something was happening in Naomi's life. She had referred to God as making her life bitter and of using his power against her to take everything away. But now, upon seeing the sovereign hand of God at work in her situation, now that she was back in the promised land, she called for a blessing from the Lord, the God of Israel, who showed her his kindness. What a change. God made me bitter to God is kind? Wow. This is a welcome change, is it not, church? This is the great Hebrew word hesed. Hesed. And the Hebrew word hesed that we've all often translated as loving kindness. This speaks of God's covenant loyalty, his merciful grace that he demonstrates to his people. Naomi recognized that God was working. God was working. Two points should be noted here to understand what's going on in this story. First off, look at what she said here. She sees God working both to the living and the dead. Don't miss that. The living and the dead. Who's the living? Well, the, the living is obviously Naomi and Ruth, right? Who are the dead? Her sons and her husband. Well, my question is this. How can God bless in time those who, non, who, those who no longer physically existed in the world? She's saying, because of what happened to us in the physical world, may this man who did this be blessed because of God's kindness to us, the living and the dead. What does she mean by that? Verse 20 is the clue. At the end of verse 20, notice what she said. The man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. What does that mean? Naomi understands the Bible. And in the Bible, there are two principles in the law that were built off of the closest relative. They were leveret marriage and the law of the kinsman redeemer. I want to explain both of, you, both of these for you this morning. Follow me closely. The, the, these, two, these two laws are what drives the book of Ruth. Let me, let me deal with the second one first. The kinsman redeemer, the law of the kinsman redeemer. This is found in Leviticus 25, verses 23 to 28. You, you, don't, you don't have to turn. Let me, let me explain to you what's, what's going on. In the law, God made provision for people when they fell into poverty. As you know, every family was given land at the conquest. And you weren't allowed to sell the land. You couldn't sell the land. But God allowed you to lease your land. 
And so if you fell into poverty, you could lease your land to someone else. And they would, they would lease your land until the year of Jubilee. What was the year of Jubilee? It was every 50 years, and in the year of Jubilee, all the land returned to its original owner. So you could lease your land until the year of Jubilee. However, God gave some prescription for you getting the land back. So, so you, you fell into poverty, you would then lease your, your land. There were three ways to get the land back. Either you wait till Jubilee and get it back. You might be dead, but your, but your son might, would, 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 would receive that land. Or you get out of poverty and you're able to buy the land back. But the third way you get, you could get the land back is a close relative. A close relative could go to the person you, you lease the land to, buy the land back, and then give it to you. What did that do for you? That gave you both the money from the person who leased it, and it gave you the land back to use. This was God's way of trying to get his people out of poverty. So she recognizes Boaz is a close relative. He can, we can sell the land that Elimelech owned, we can sell it, get money, and then he can buy the land back and give it to us, and we have both the land and we got the money. She recognizes God is doing something. God is doing something. But the second law was, this, was the law of leveret marriage. This is found in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10. What is, what is the law of leveret marriage? Well, in le this is basically how it works. God did not want any family in Israel's name going out of existence. Every, every family name must remain. So what happens when a man dies and he does not have any children? Well, in leveret marriage, what would happen is the brother of the husband was then responsible to marry the deceased brother's wife. And the first child born from that union was legally recognized as the deceased husband's son, legally, he bore his name and then he continued that line on. So, what do we see here? Neither Malon or Chilion had children. And thus the family name was in danger of going out of existence. Without any other brothers to marry Ruth, what was the only option? A close relative. Naomi says, again in verse 20, the man is our relative, he's one of our closest relatives. Naomi recognized that God had sovereignly brought Ruth to Boaz's field. Ruth happened upon the field. That was God. Naomi realized that Boaz has, had extended himself in some unusual ways to give them more, more grain to survive. She recognizes something's going on. So she begins the transformation process as she begins to see that God is working even in her circumstances and her situations. And this leads us to, to chapter 3. In chapter 3, we see faith consummated with practice. Faith consummated with practice. Now, the third chapter of Ruth is where we experience the fireworks. This is the fireworks. Because we have two controversial events here in chapter 3. The first one is that there's no way around it. Ruth proposed to Boaz. We don't normally do that, although in our culture it's becoming more and more common for women to propose to men. But clearly there's no way around that here. I mean, Ruth is proposing marriage to Boaz. The second thing that's unusual is there's no way around it. Ruth spent the whole night in the field with Boaz. 
Just read it. You, you can't get past it. Now, although both of those sound controversial, they're really not. Once you understand, once you understand what truly happened, you, you understand that it's not the way it's painted oftentimes by some people who look, look at this text. And I, and I, I, I don't have time to go into all of this. Again, I, I would just refer you back to my sermons on Ruth where I, I explained the, the, uh, the culture, the, 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 the law, all the things surrounding what's going on here. But they were not sexually active in the field. And this offering of herself for marriage was followed biblically prescribed lines. Okay? She did this on the counsel of an older woman who understood the Bible. She wasn't just going up and saying, you know, I want to propose to that guy. That's not how it works. Anyway, if you want to listen to the sermons on Ruth, they, they give you more explanation. Let's, let's focus on what's going on here from Naomi's vantage point. Within this chapter, within this chapter, <laughs> I like this, Naomi moves from spectator of God's working to advocating for God's working. Up until this time, she was just watching God work. But now she jumps in and she, and she advocates for God. Okay, go God. I mean, she, she, I mean her, her whole situation has changed. She's now personally advocating and directing people towards the will of God. She has changed in her disposition. Look at how the chapter begins, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter... Shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Notice here that Naomi is acting not for Naomi. Naomi's acting for Ruth's benefit. Do, do you see how she's changed? I mean, in, in chapter 1, it's all about what happened to me, all the stuff I went through. And now she's, see, she's put herself to the side. Let me, let me focus on someone else. Do you see that? Her concern? Th this is what happens when you really begin to live by faith. It's no longer all about you. It's about God's people. And she's concerned for Ruth and her security. The word security here is, is, the, is the Hebrew word for rest. She wants her to find rest. What's her advice? Well, her advice is pretty straightforward. Number one, make yourself as attractive as possible. <laughs> right? I mean, that's basically what she, I mean, you, you, look at, you look at verse six, six seven, eight. I mean, she, you know, give, get, get a bath, anoint yourself, put on some clean clothes, you know, make sure you look good. Yes. I smell good. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. She gives you the advice, make yourself as attractive as possible. And then, she says, go to the threshing floor. Now, what was, the, what was going on here at the, 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 uh, the threshing floor? Well, in a, in a town like Bethlehem, there would have been one threshing floor in which every farmer would take their turns and winnow their, their crops on a particular evening. And so each family, again, you had all these fields, they would harvest their fields and they would take turns one at a time, one, one, one landowner at a time, going to that threshing floor with his servants and they would all, and they would winnow that wheat and they would sleep, sleep with the wheat to make sure nobody take, nobody took. So Naomi said, look, I've, I've been doing some research <laughs> and Boaz, it's Boaz's turn to win a week. He's at the winnowing, uh, the winnowing thing tonight. So she says to Ruth, go there, make sure nobody can see you. So sneak, sneak there. And then make sure you look at where he lies down. And then when nobody can see you, go out there, uncover his feet and lay down. This was, this was a, a, uh, a custom, and basically what she does is she, she, the, a person would lay at the person's feet and then would ask them to cover them over, okay? That was, a, that was an offer of, of marriage. She's offering marriage here, all right? Now, what does Ruth do? 
Ruth does. <laughs> as, any, as any godly young lady would do, she paid heed to the counsel of the older woman who had discipled her in functioning as a Jewish person up to this point in her life. Who had been giving her biblical direction up to this point? Naomi had. Is she now going to disobey Naomi? No. Can I just say something to young ladies? It's not just the existence of older women in the faith that, you, that needs to happen. Younger ladies need to want to be instructed. Amen. They need to want guidance. If you as a young lady think you got it all together, you're in trouble. <laughs> the fact of the matter is you don't have it all together. You need an older woman or women who can come in and give you guidance and instruction in God's word. It's necessary. Amen. And Ruth's godliness comes out here as she said, oh, I don't, don't want to do that. That's not what Ruth said. Get, get out of here. I'm not going to do it. That's crazy advice. No, she, she follows through what Naomi said to do. What does Boaz, how does Boaz respond? <coughs> Boaz is blown out the water. <coughs> He's blown out the water. And notice the humility of this man. He said, you could have gone after somebody younger than me. Remember, he's Elimelech's age. <laughs> and you, you selected me. I mean, I, who am I? I mean, he, you, you, you see the godly humility because the Bible introduces him in chapter 2 as a rich man. Yes, yes. But here was a man who wasn't controlled by his riches. Yes. He didn't determine his life by what he possessed. He determined his life by what God said about it. And he was humble. He was a, a, somebody who recognized his place before God. And when, and, when, and when she comes to offer him marriage, he's taken back himself yes. and humbled by the offer. So what, is, what does Boaz do? <clears throat> well, first off, Boaz preserved Ruth's reputation. He woke up before people began to figure out, well, who's what and where. Sends her home before people could begin to ask, well, what, where's she, what's she going out of? So he preserves her reputation. Can I say something? Young men, if there's a woman that you would like to marry one day, yes. what's your responsibility? <laughs> Preserve her reputation. If he's unwilling to preserve your reputation, you got some questions to answer. Yes. He should be more concerned about your reputation than you are. He safeguarded Ruth, right? Yes. And then he did the unnecessary. He heaped on her a whole bunch of grain. I mean, the, the amount of grain the Bible I, I, I identifies is, it doesn't make any sense. But it makes sense when you understand this is a dowry. He's out in the field. He doesn't have much, but what he does have is grain. So he gives her a bunch of grain. <laughs> he, he does what he can do to fulfill what God has expected him to do. And then she goes back to Naomi. And here, we, and here we hear Naomi for the last time in this book. And I love the way her last words in this book end. Verse 18. Then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. Hasn't Naomi changed? <laughs> Hasn't Naomi changed? Here's a woman of patient faith. Where did that come from? God has totally reformed this woman's life. Naomi's faith is not shaking anymore, is it, church? 
She is confident. She is confident in what God was doing in their life. She, she, she's been learning. Listen, she's been learning to look at the hand of the Lord in her life and was trusting in God's ways. Surely this will bear fruit, will it not? Notice what I mean verse, in chapter 4, the, the f- faith's fruitfulness. Faith's fruitfulness. Although we do not hear Naomi speak again in the book of Ruth, we do have a picture of Naomi that gives witness to faith's fruitfulness. It unfolds against the backdrop of the city gates of Bethlehem, where all local business, whether it be personal, familial, or economic, took place. Here the elders would oversee what happened, making the proceedings both culturally and judicially legitimate. We see that it's in verses 1 through 2. This was like going to city hall. The, the events of, of the chapter begin, notice, with a little drama at first. Because out in the field, Boaz had told Ruth, hey, look, there's a closer relative. I'll, I'll do what you want me to do, but, but there's a closer relative, and, and he must go first. And so here at the beginning of, of chapter 4, the, the, the closer relative comes into town. Uh, Boaz pulls him aside. He pulls some elders aside. They sit down, and they say, hey, look, he explains to him that there's some land. Elimelech's died. Malon's died. Telion's died. Buy the, buy the field. If you don't buy it, I'll take it. And at first, we, we don't know this guy at all, but at first he jumps on the deal. Oh, say, yeah, I want that. Remember, an Israelite couldn't sell his property. So in Israel, there was no way to get more land if you wanted it. So this guy said, oh, man, this is some more land. Yeah, I'll do that. Then Boaz says, ah, before you do, the land comes with a woman. (laughs) Ruth. He he begins backpedaling quick, right? He don't want want no part of that. He want no part. He said, I'll take the land, not the woman. You can't have either. And the elders are there to give witness to it, Right? He's more concerned about himself than he is God's law. God's law prescribed this. God's law prescribed this. So he steps back. Boaz, on the other hand, immediately stepped forward to fulfill God's design. And he, he, he both purchased everything of Elimelech as well as Chilion and Malon, and then he committed to Mary Ruth to raise up the name of the deceased on his property through a legal ear for Chilion. I mean, Boaz might as well be quoting directly from the Bible here. I mean, he's, he's, he's that specific in verses 9 and 10. This whole event, this whole event is warmly received by the whole community in Bethlehem. And they bless, they bless the soon-to-be-married couple. And notice what it says in verses 13 through 15. It says, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. Now, now, now she couldn't have any children in, in Moab. Do you think God was doing something? And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord, who has not left you without a redeemer today. And may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be the restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. What a witness to the Almighty working on behalf of his people. But there's more. According to verse 17, Naomi raised the child herself. And why? Because he was considered her legal heir. And so he was assumed to have been born from Naomi. But you know what? It gets better than that. Because as you read to the end of the book, what do you find out? that this little boy 
became the grandfather of King David. <laughs> Do you think God can't change your circumstances? <laughs> Do you think that God can't take your mess ups and accomplish his will? Do you think just because your faith is shaking and you it is shaking, you make bad decisions that God can't turn that around? Yeah, he can. This young man, born out of these horrific situations, his, his, his grandfather passed, his, his father and his uncle passed, and, he, and he's born to a Moabitess who was not allowed to be among the people of God. God said, no Moabites can be a part of my people, but he let in Ruth. And from Ruth will come David. And from David will come Jesus Christ. And Ruth turns out to be one of the, I think, three women mentioned in Christ's genealogy. Look at God. Look at God. Look what he can do. Even with a little bit of found, floundering faith. Why? Because it's not about how much faith you got. It's about how big the God is who you have faith in. And that's what we believe. It's the bigness of God that's the issue, not, not my, my faith and how big it is. Why? Because it's not about you anyway. It's about God and what he can do. Saints, this is a good example to us of how faith matures even in us. Thank you, Lord. It reminds us that even though our faith, when tested, might lead us into some failures, that that's not the end of our story. Amen. Staying connected to the place of God, staying connected to the people of God is used by God to move our floundering, shaken faith to enliven it, to strengthen it, and to bear fruit from it. We thank God Amen. for what he can do in faithless people like us, he will always be faithful. And I'm so thankful that although we might flounder, struggle, and even question sometimes, God remains faithful to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you, Lord God, for this story of faith that challenges us to be people of faith. Lord God, that, that song that introduced the message today was so powerful. You know us completely, but you love us completely. That's the story of Naomi and Ruth. You knew her floundering, shaky faith but you worked through that anyway. We thank you, Lord God, that you can work in people like us. For anyone here this morning that doesn't know you, Lord God, I pray that today they would turn from their sin to the Savior. They would repent from their sin and embrace Christ and that they would know what it means to live a life of faith in him, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to say to the media, let's uh, nix the When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. I think most appropriately would be great is thy faithfulness. So if you would turn to your hymn, your hymnals.